We know you've been sitting on pins and needles and busting at the seams since last Sunday, waiting for this week's podcast. You'll learn words like pins, needles, seams, cuffs, thimble, and many more in this creative episode of Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. Hello, welcome to Aprender Inglés. I'm Reza. And I'm Craig. How are you, Craig? Very well, thank you. If you're a new listener to this podcast, you're very welcome. On this podcast, we're going to help you improve your English, grow your grammar, vocalize your vocabulary, perfect your pronunciation, and all that good stuff. Have you had a good week? I have, I have. I've been busy, but I've got a lot done. A productive week. I'll tell you who's had quite a noisy week, and that's Fofi from Badajoz because of the animals on his farm. Let's listen to Fofi's voice message. Hi, Craig. Hi, Reza. This is Fofi from Badajoz. I'm a redneck from the rural part of, of Spain. Uh, I was studying in, in the 19s uh, my engineer degree when Reza was living in Cáceres. What a pity I didn't meet him in that wonderful city. I suppose Reza knows really well Plaza Mayor, the old city, and of course, the Madrila. Now I'm studying a big one course, and you are the vitamin I need to improve my rusty skills. Why don't you talk about the Spanish or European cities? Uh, you can talk about the culture or the, festi the festivals. Have a nice day and never change the way you do these episodes. I enjoy them so much. Reza, recuerda, Hacha, Higo y Higuera. Cheers. Dog, shut up. Fofi, thank you very much for your message. We, we listened to it two or three times and we laughed for a long time. Thank you. That was a lovely message. And I especially like the animals. Very nice touch. Be careful, Fofi, when you use the word redneck. We understood the meaning, but to some people it may be a bit insulting, especially if you're speaking about people in, in America and you call them rednecks. So be careful when you use that uh, that word. Hi, Fofi. Thanks very much for your, your message. And yes, it it's brought back nice memories for me from years ago in Etramora. You're a Pathense from Banajo, but don't worry. We like you as well. We who've lived in Cafare, because <laughs> unless people, people perhaps don't know, but even in Etramora, there's incredible competition between the two provinces of that region, Banajo and Cafare. I like people from Banajo, Fofi. I, li I like Pacense rednecks, don't worry. I've never spent much time in Banajo Ciudad, but yes, I do know Cafre very well, as you say. Patrimonio de la Humanidad, a world heritage city, beautiful place. And yes, it's a good idea for us to talk about Spanish cities, and I would mm -hmm. certainly mention Cafre if I did. Let's not forget Barajo. So what about Merida, maybe? I think Merida might be on the UNESCO list for its its Roman theater and a few other things. So let's not forget Barajo. Yeah, we should do that in, a, in an episode soon. Speak about some Spanish cities and the fiestas around Spain. One thing, Fofi, you said, what a pity I didn't met him. What a pity I didn't met Reza. It should be what a pity I didn't meet him. So it's a pity yeah. you didn't meet Reza. Did you notice anything else, Reza, that could help Fofi improve a little? Yes, Fofi, you said, now I study. Well, I presume you're doing it at the moment and you haven't finished. So present continuous would be better. I'm studying because it's in progress and it's temporary. You, you haven't always been studying. It's just now. So I'm studying a B1 course. 
Yeah, what a pity I didn't bump into you. Who knows? Maybe we passed each other in the street and we didn't know it back in the 1990s. I know all the places you said, the main square, the Plaza Mayor, La Madrila. I lived in Calle Santi Espiritu. I don't know if you know it, <laughs> but it's right beside the main square. How do you say in English, el mundo es un pamuelo? It's a small world. It's a small world. Yes, it is. Next, we have an email from Marcelo Fernandez, who says, My father is a tailor, and my mother teaches how to stitch. So I'd like to suggest a list of words related to sewing in a podcast. I thought of them as starting from verbs like sew or hem to objects like pins, needles, or even a thimble. Why not garment parts like sleeves or cuffs? I trust in your imagination. Perhaps you could combine it with knitting. Well, Marcelo, thank you very, very much for your email. We love the suggestion. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Reza, could you start us off with some vocabulary connected to sewing? Yes, some of the words that Marth Thelo suggested are useful words to know, and I imagine not many of the listeners know them. But you should if you want to talk about these things. The word so, you think you know it, but maybe you don't. I'm not talking about so. You probably know that so. Like uh, Craig loves chocolate so much that uh, he dreams about it. That's one so. But we're talking about S-E-W so. Ah, coser. So the pronunciation is the same of S-O and S-E-W. And in fact, there's another word, S-O-W, which is also pronounced so. But they have different meanings. And different spellings. They're homophones, in other words. We did an episode recently about homophones, words which are spelt differently but have the same pronunciation. S-O, entonces, or tan. S-E-W, so, coser, that's the one we're interested in today. But also S-O-W, sembrar, like to sow seeds in a field, like Fofi probably does, sembrar las semillas. <laughs> but we'll be talking about S-E-W, so. So now, so now... So now that we've um, shown you the meaning of that word, I think we can sew this episode up, don't you, Reza? I think we can sew it up now. Yes, to wrap something up, sew something up, to finish something. Wrap is W-R-A-P. It means to, to close or package. Exactly. But no, we're not going to wrap up or sew up this episode. We have many more words to talk to you about. If you're going to sew, you need a needle and thread. T-H-R-E-A-D. A needle and thread. Aguja y hilo. The basic tools of Marcelo's mother's work because she teaches how to stitch. She's a sewing teacher. I guess she has a good sewing kit so sewing i said there without thinking i said so sewing <laughs> quite often we use the word so so just to fill in a space in english it doesn't really have any meaning so sewing kit s-e-w-i-n-g kit is a kit a collection of useful objects that you need for sewing craig do you take a sewing kit with you when you travel yes i do just a very basic one because maybe I need to sew on a button or maybe repair some clothes that I need. So, yeah, I take a very small sewing kit with me. Do you do your own sewing? Do you sew your own socks and sew on buttons and take up trousers if they're too long? To take up means make shorter. I can stitch. I can sew. Stitch is a un punto. I can stitch on or I can sew on a button on a shirt. Me too. Or if one's loose, I can make it a bit tighter. I always have. I've always done it myself. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And I, I don't like having loose buttons. 
I prefer to sew them on before they fall off. Me too. And it's I'm I'm quite good at it to be honest. Yeah, I don't <laughs> like I don't like living dangerously. I don't like living <laughs> thinking my button's going to fall off. Yeah, me too. I hate the idea of losing a button, particularly if it's a nice button, yeah. and I won't be able to replace it with the same one and exactly. then that shirt will be useless. It's so annoying. Yeah. And very often they sell clothes these days, particularly cheap clothes with the buttons already really loose and it, they look like you're only going to be able to use them about two or three times and the button will fall off. So I, I sew them up tight. Mm-hmm. Me too. So as Reza said, to stitch is punto. And there's an expression, an idiom. You may have heard, a stitch in time saves nine. What does that mean, Reza? That means if you, if you sort out, if you solve a problem immediately, now it may save extra work later. Like when you're, when you're sewing, when it, if you stitch in the right place, if you don't forget, then everything will be all right. But if you don't stitch now at the right time, you might have to undo all the stitches and go back and correct it later. So, so stitch properly now and the garments, the clothes will be okay. Craig, have you ever had stitches? No, I haven't. I've never... I don't think I have. Maybe when I was very, very young and I don't remember, but I don't think I've ever cut myself badly enough to need mm-hmm. stitches. Have you? I have. I've had stitches a couple of times. Yep. Where, where have you had them? Uh, I, I mean, not like which city. I mean, where in your body? <laughs> <laughs> I've had uh, an operation once. I I had to get my tendon repaired on my wrist, so I had I had stitches on my wrist. Right. And when I was very, very young, I cut the palm of my hand and I had stitches in that. So we're talking about medical stitches. So same in Spanish, isn't it? Puntos. Hmm. So we also say stitches for when they, when they stitch, when they sew up your skin so it doesn't separate. Our next word is pin, alfiler. So people use pins when they're sewing. For example, if you want to take up your sleeves, as mangas, or take up your jeans or trousers, make them shorter, then you pin them in place and sew after. Pins are alfileres. Yeah, as, as Craig just demonstrated, it can also be a verb. To pin something means to attach it to fix it somewhere with a pin and there's another kind of pin that's a little different because it's a very safe pin there's no sharp edge or sharp end that's open it's called a safety pin well you can open it and close it you can but it's kind of like a v-shape isn't it that's right it's in spanish imperdible do you remember way back in the 1980s it was uh it was a fashion for some people, particularly people interested in punk, to put safety pins in their ears yep. instead of earrings. I had friends in school who had safety pins in their noses, in their ears, in their lips. Yeah, all yeah. sorts of places. Craig, have you ever had pins and needles? I have. Pins and needles? Are we talking about in your sewing kit? In my sewing kit and also on my body. So pins and needles means cosquilleo or hormigueo. It can be either of those words in Spanish, but we say it as a collocation, pins and needles. They're more or less the same thing. I mean, a needle looks very similar to a pin, but that's our way of saying it in English. When you have that strange feeling on your on your skin or under your skin, which is difficult to describe, you have pins and needles. Sometimes I go to sleep on my arm. My arm is under my body and there's an expression you can say to go numb. That means there's no feeling in it. But also you get the feeling sometimes of pins and needles in your skin. Craig, you mentioned a word right at the beginning, the word thimble. What is that? Dedal, a very small protective cup that goes on your finger when you're sewing. You can also have a thimble full of whiskey. Would you fancy a thimble of whiskey, Reza? After with your, the podcast, with your coffee. yes, after the podcast, we better finish first because it might have a bad effect on the podcast if we drink it now. That's true. I'll have a thimble full of whiskey, a small cup. What does the word seam mean? Because seam 
S double E M means parece, it seems to me, me parece que, it seems, but S E A M? Ah, the homophone, the other one. That's costera. So the seam of a, a skirt, for example, imagine uh, someone, uh, a woman's skirt, la falda, was beginning to fall apart. Maybe it's because the seam of the skirt is coming undone. So think of the verb done, hecho. So undone, deshecho, falling apart. So seams are very important to keep clothes together. If the seam becomes undone, your clothes will fall apart. In sewing, we speak about the hem of a garment or a piece of clothing, H-E-M, which is dobladillo or hacerle dobladillo in Spanish. To hem a garment or the hem of a garment. Craig, how would you describe, I'm not quite sure myself, the difference between seam and hem? For me, I think I'm right, although obviously Marcelo's mum would know a lot more about this. The seam is the line where you you stitch near the edge or near the joint. Whereas isn't, the isn't hem, the hem is like the border? Area. Isn't the hem the amount of material that you take up? Yes. So hems are just at the edge. Is that it? Hems are at the edge. For example, imagine a woman wearing a skirt. For example. Mm-hmm. So if you were to imagine looking at look at her from her feet and move upwards. So at the bottom of her skirt, you will arrive at the hem. Yeah. At the bottom. That's so right. So it's been folded, doblado, up, and then you stitch around it to keep that in place. Right. That's the hem. Whereas the seam could be anywhere. It's just where two pieces of material are joined together, right? Because you can have a, th- a seam of coal. Right. Where the two come together. So you can, have a, rock. you can have a seam down the side of your trousers. You've got the seam. Yes. The two halves are joined at the seam, right? Yeah. Whereas the hem is at the bottom, the edge bit, the el borde, yeah? And the seam is where they join together. That's right. it. I think that's what the difference is. Me too. Yeah, I'm not sure if we got our Spanish right, but we think it's seam costera and hem dobladillo. And we mentioned the verb earlier on to take up the phrasal verb, which means to make something shorter. So usually when I buy trousers, they're much too long. So I need to take up the leg of the trousers on both legs, take up the sleeves on a shirt or a jacket. And the opposite would be to let down. If your trousers are not long enough, but you have a big hem, you can let down the hem, this bit at the bottom, so el doble dio, so they don't fold it, doblarlo, so much, but it'll be a bit longer. And another meaning of hem, if you are surrounded by cars when you park, for example, and you can't move your car, you can say that you are hemmed in, H-E-M-M-E-D-I-N, hemmed in. I was hemmed in by two white cars. I couldn't move, I couldn't leave my parking space because I was hemmed in, closed in by other cars. Yes, if you can imagine like those two cars, like make a border, yeah, like the, 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 the hem is the, the edge, the end of something that you can't pass, it's the end. So if you're hemmed in, you can't go past. Craig mentioned the word cuff earlier on. That's C-U-F-F, cuff. Usually you have two cuffs because it's puño. So you usually have two parts, two arms, we can say in English, or sleeves, mangas, arms or sleeves of a shirt. So you're going to have two cuffs, puños. So the cuffs are the end of the sleeves, mangas, or or arms. Craig, what are cuff links? The word link means to connect or to join. So cufflinks are pieces of jewellery, usually, that connect the two sides of your cuffs together. I think these days you don't see people wearing cufflinks very often. They seem to be quite old-fashioned. Do you own a pair of cufflinks? Do you, have you ever used them? I own a pair of Pink Panther cufflinks. <laughs> You're kidding. I do. You're joking. Yeah, oh, because I I used to be, in fact, I still am a big fan of the Pink Panther. (laughs) I have a pair of Pink Panther cufflinks. Really? I I think I once wore them at a wedding. I'd love to see them. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so you must have shirts then with the holes in the cuffs. Well, I think I have a shirt. Okay. Because you need special shirts. Shirts which, instead of a button, have a hole without a button where you put the cufflink through and then close it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And of course, for me, the worst thing about cufflinks is that it's not worth getting really good expenses ones because they're so easy to lose. Yeah. They can so easily fall off the cuff. Then you've got two problems. One, you've lost the cuff link. And two, you now can't close the cuff of your shirt. So they're not very practical, to be honest. I don't think I've ever, ever worn them. Um, another thing I've never worn connected to cuffs, handcuffs. Esposas. Have you ever worn handcuffs, Reza? I've never been arrested. Although, of course, some people might wear handcuffs in a more social, intimate uh, situation, but I haven't myself. In, in the bedroom, you mean? Yes, possibly. Fluffy handcuffs. Fluffy is like the peluche. Uh, <laughs> I haven't myself, but, you know, for those who do, go for it. Enjoy yourselves. I've got this horrible picture in my head now of Reza in <laughs> fluffy pink handcuffs and pink panther cufflinks. <laughs> no, that is a, that's a, a shocking thought. <laughs> <laughs> so we said before, sleeves are mangas. And if you have a shirt, you may have short sleeves. So then it's a short sleeved shirt. So that becomes an adjective. Short sleeved shirt. And Craig, what if you got a shirt with sleeves, but it's a bit warm and you wish you didn't have those sleeves? What can you do? You can wear a sleeveless shirt. Well, presuming you're in the street and you can't go home, what can you do? (laughs) So you've got long sleeves or short sleeves? You've got long sleeves, but you wish you didn't. And it's really very warm. Well, then you can turn up your sleeves. You can turn up your sleeves. Turn up is a phrasal verb and it's a separable phrasal verb which means you can put the object in the middle of the verb and the preposition so you could turn them up or turn your sleeves up yeah. or, or roll up or roll, roll up, up yeah well. to be honest i wouldn't say turn up myself but yeah it's dead right i would tend to say roll up so roll up or turn up your sleeves roll up your sleeves if your shirt does not have any sleeves it is sleeveless so a sleeveless shirt you said turn up and what if i had trousers with turn ups on them what's that then oh you don't see i think turn ups on trousers disappeared with cufflinks turn ups are where maybe an inch or an inch and a half what's that four centimeters three centimeters at the bottom of your trousers are turned up and sewed in place but that's not unusual but when was the last time you saw turn ups? But, but, but hold on, hold on. What, what you say about having a big, a big hem mm. is not unusual. The unusual thing is that the hem is visible from the outside. With right. Turn-ups. That's the weird bit. Because in Spain, people turn up their trousers all the time, mm-hmm. but they put the hem in the inside. Right. So you can't see it. But with turn ups, it's the reverse. You fold it up on the outside so you can see the hem. Right. Yeah. That's the weird thing about it, yeah? Yeah. Very old-fashioned, yeah. I used to have a pair, and you used to get all sorts of bits of rubbish and fluff and dirt and cigarette ash collecting in the turn-up because the turn-up was on the outside. Have you have you ever had a pair of turn-ups? A long time ago, a long time ago, yeah, but not, not recently. Were they pinstriped? They weren't pinstriped, no, no. Stripe is reya, so if you have a pinstriped pair of trousers or a pinstriped suit, they, they used to have turn-ups. Yeah. That's a real classic British businessman's look, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, to mend something means to fix or to repair. Arreglar in Spanish. Do you mend your own clothes, Reza? I asked you this before. As as I say, I do sew on buttons... And I've tried to mend zips occasionally or zippers, la crema y ora. That's that's difficult. That's very difficult. That's above my level. Yeah, I usually don't succeed. I've tried it, but I don't. But Mm. I'm pretty good with buttons. Pretty good with buttons. Buttons are my limit. I don't go beyond buttons. Moving on to knitting. To knit is hacer punto or tejer. And what do you knit with? Oh, one thing about knitting, it's a silent 
K. So the spelling is K N I T, the pronunciation knit. So it's spelled with a K, but it's not pronounced. Knitting needles are the long needles that you need if you're going to knit something. So your knitting needles, very important part of your knitting kit. What else do you need when you're knitting, Reza, apart from needles? Well, the classic way to knit is with a ball of wool. That's W-O-O-L, wool, lana. But of course, you can knit with other materials. You can use acrylic and all sorts of things. But wool is the classic knitting material. And something I've never really understood, I'm sure Marcelo can explain it to me, and hopefully you can too. What's the difference between to knit and to crochet, which sounds very French, ganchillo, to crochet something? I have no idea. Okay, Marcelo, I, I let just, us know. <laughs> I, I just know the words are different, but to be honest, I don't know. I think you don't use knitting needles with crocheting. You use a special crocheting tool. Ah. I know it's different, but... It, I think, isn't the, isn't the point different? So a knitting needle is just a long uh, circular or tubular, I should say, object with a point at the end but i think crochet has something strange on the point doesn't it like a hook yeah gancho yeah i'm not in my area of expertise here you can probably tell but either (laughs) but i'm sure marcelo will clarify that for us there is a difference between crocheting and knitting knitting is a third punto or tejer and to crochet is ganchillo it it must be cray because ganchillo that's got to be related to the word gancho which is a hook Makes sense. So that's like a knitting needle, but with a hook at the end, let's say. And I do know the meaning of this word, to embroider, which has strange spelling, E-M-B-R-O-I-D-E-R, which is to sew a design onto something, bordar. So, for example, if you have a lovely tablecloth, you could sew a design into the tablecloth and make a nice picture or a nice pattern. It's something that I appreciate A friend of mine from Alicante got me into embroidery and she... What does get me into mean? To get you into something means to get you to be enthusiastic about it or interested in it. A friend of mine from Alicante gave me as a present a couple of beautifully embroidered sheets and a tablecloth embroidered by hand done by artisan workers in the Sierra de Mariola. What about that for detail, eh? Wow. Yeah, sheets and tablecloths, hand embroidered, not done on a machine, eh? Hand embroidered, which is a lot of work in the Sierra de Mariola, in the province of Alicante. Now that's quality embroidery. For me, the Spanish are very, very good at embroidery. I think that's one of the things that they're really outstanding at doing. I've seen some beautiful embroidered tablecloths and linen and, and bed linen and... Um, napkins, all sorts of things, really, really beautifully embroidered by Spanish uh, workers and craftsmen. And they know what they're talking about. In fact, this friend of mine, their their aunt, she could look at about 20 different embroidered objects and she knows immediately if they're done by hand or a machine, probably what country they come from. She (laughs) said, I just don't know how she does it. Even the absolute top quality machine, she can say... That's done in a machine in China. This one is handmade in in Belgium. That one's handmade in France. That one's machine done in France. I don't know how she can tell just by looking. I'm I'm astounded. I wonder if Marcelo's mum's the same. Is she, Marcelo? Let us know. The last word we have is threadbare. The adjective threadbare. T-H-R-E-A-D-B-A-R-E. Threadbare. What would you, how would you describe that, Reza, if you had a threadbare jacket or a threadbare piece of clothing? Well, I I do actually have several threadbare pieces of clothing. Uh, But the word threadbare in general is pretty much a good summary of my life. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) 
threadbare. Do you have a threadbare existence? Yeah, I do, actually. <laughs> and not only physically, but, you know, metaphorically as well. So B-A-R-E, as Craig said, means with nothing on it. So threadbare, the threads are bare, they're disappearing, they're going. So it describes <laughs> old material, which is damaged through use. So I have jackets that are so old, they're so damaged that... For example, round the cuffs or round the hems or other places, they've become threadbare. Why do you keep them? Because I like them. I just really like them. And probably because I don't want to spend money on new ones, but above all, <laughs> because I like them. Uh, so, yeah, I, I have jackets that I've had for maybe not 20 years, but for 10 years. And they're threadbare in places. They'll fall apart soon if I'm not careful. They're coming apart at the seams. <laughs> yes, and we, we often use it metaphorically, as I said. So Craig uh, mentioned that I have a threadbare existence. That means my life kind of functions minimally, but you could, there's holes in it. It's like falling <laughs> to pieces. It, it's like an old jacket, which you can still wear, but just about pretty soon it, it could just fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Let's move on to idioms. There are quite a few sewing idioms that we can share with you. Idioms connected to this sewing vocabulary. We've already mentioned that a stitch in time saves nine. So maybe it's an idea for Reza to repair his jacket quickly before they fall apart. A stitch in time would save nine. What does this one mean, Reza? The whole nine yards... Yes, that's an American expression, I think, originally, but it's become very popular everywhere. It means to do everything possible. If you go the whole nine yards, you're going to make every effort you can to do whatever you've got to do right. You're not going to be lazy. You're going to absolutely do everything under your control. Every week, Reza and I go the whole nine yards to get a podcast to you every Sunday. There's also an expression I've heard coming out of America recently called the whole enchilada, which means something very similar, which means everything, to do everything you can. I'll, I'll do the whole enchilada. I'll do everything to make it happen. Bursting at the seams. Bursting at the seams or bursting or bulging at the seams. Too many people. If I said, for example, the hotel we stayed in was nice, but it was bursting at the seams with guests... There were just too many people. So if a place or a hotel or a party or anything is bursting at the seams, it's too full. Too many people or too many things. If it's bursting, that means it's actually breaking. There's so much in it that, that it's going to break. Bulging just means very full. It's, it's really got more than what it's designed to hold. So, for example, Craig, if I were to say that your trousers were bulging, what might be the explanation? <laughs> Probably that I've been eating too much, cho <laughs> too much chocolate, I would hope. I'm, I'm glad you said that <laughs> and not something else. <laughs> I know it doesn't seem like it. Did you notice? Did you see what I did there? It doesn't seem like it. It doesn't appear like it. But we do not do this podcast off the cuff. We prepare before we speak. Off the cuff means without any preparation. So our suggestion is if you're going to do your own podcast or if you're giving a presentation, don't do it off the cuff. Make sure you prepare, make some notes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true. But Craig, we do throw in the occasional off the cuff remark. Yes. Like when I mentioned now about Craig possibly having bulging trousers, he didn't know I was going to say that particular thing. That was off the cuff. That was off the cuff. So most of it is scripted, but bit of it is off the cuff. So off the cuff can mean without preparation. Reza, would you say you're the kind of person who who wears their heart on their sleeve? Not usually, but occasionally. So what does it mean to wear your heart on your sleeve? Well, remember we said sleeve was manga. Yeah, the shirt sleeve. So it means to openly show your feelings or emotions rather than keeping them hidden. If you can imagine that you could see my emotions um, 
actually on on my arms, my sleeves, they would, they would be very easy to see. I usually don't, but sometimes I do, depending on the situation. When I think it's it's very important to be frank, I do. But otherwise... What does it mean to be frank? Frank, Franco. So sometimes, yes, I do. Yeah, I was looking earlier on for some notes and some papers. And do you know, Reza, my office is a complete disaster. It's a complete mess. I can't find anything. And I must, I must next week sort out and arrange my files and my papers because when I need something, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So what does that mean to look for a needle in a haystack? Well, we already said what a needle was. That's the aguja, right? And a haystack, hay is eno, and a stack is a pile. So if you can think of a pile of hay, a big pile of hay, after the farmers cut the grass to dry it to make hay in the summer... Imagine you threw a needle in the middle of that. What are the chances of finding that needle? Very, very, very small chance of finding it. That's a needle in a haystack. Another idiom connected to sewing, to be hanging on by a thread, which means to be in great danger of losing something valuable. Let's say, for example, you have a life-threatening disease. We hope you don't, but if you have a very serious disease, maybe your life is hanging on by a thread. Or if your marriage is going very badly, your marriage could be hanging on by a thread. Or let's say you're always late for work, your boss is really angry with you, then your job could be hanging on by a thread. Any moment, you're going to lose it. Another expression with thread, there are quite a few, is to follow the thread of for example, a plot, a story. I'll give you an example. Some of you probably know that Netflix series, uh, Narcos. I found as the series went on and on, it was quite difficult to follow the thread. Yeah, which one though? The one in Colombia or the one in Mexico? Well, particularly the one in Mexico. The one in Colombia was quite hard, but the one in Mexico uh, got even harder because there were so many characters... I I was finding it hard to remember what had happened and where we were going. So it was quite hard to follow the thread, seguir el hilo, in Spanish, of the story. If you're in a crowd, just imagine being in Valencia during Fayas in March when it's full of people and you can't move because everybody in the street is standing next to each other. You have to thread your way through the crowd. Abrir paso. So you could say, I threaded my way to the front of the concert crowd, for example. I threaded my way to the stage. I threaded my way through the crowds on the busy street. Craig mentioned earlier the feeling of pins and needles. And if you're sitting on pins and needles, it means extreme nervousness or you're very anxious while awaiting results. Imagine you've done an English exam, you don't know if you passed. And you're waiting to find out, sitting on pins and needles. All of these expressions, of course, are written in the show notes for you at inglespodcast.com slash 239. Another expression that could be useful as an idiom to fall apart at the seams. We've explained the meaning of seam, S-E-A-M. If a person falls apart at the seams, they could be very, very emotional extremely emotional over a situation say for example a person is um, having a divorce and it's a very traumatic divorce maybe emotionally they fall apart at the seams they collapse and they're completely destroyed by the emotional situation she was falling apart at the seams when her boyfriend broke up with her craig can you remember the last time that you were in stitches do you mean laughing a lot Yes. Very hard, laughing a lot. I saw a Monty Python film recently and I started laughing a lot about that. Life of Brian, Lady of Brian, very, very funny film. I was in stitches at some parts, not all the way through the film, but there were some particular scenes that had me in stitches. I was laughing a lot. So compare that with to have stitches. 
I have had stitches when I cut my hand years ago. They had to give me stitches. I had stitches. But Craig was to be, was in stitches. That means he laughed a lot. Or I said the film had me in stitches. To have someone in stitches. Craig, have you ever been stitched up? To stitch someone up means to betray, traicionar, or to frame someone, incriminar, a un inocente. No, I have never been stitched up on purpose. I'm trying to think of a situation where I have been. Have you? Have you been stitched up? Not that I can remember. Certainly not very badly if I have. Nothing really serious. Not like, uh, you know ending up in prison or something like that. Like imagine the situation, um, let's say the corrupt police officer stitched me up. He knows I'm innocent, but he framed me and I'm in prison. He made me look guilty, but I'm not. He stitched me up. If you're similar to someone in temperament or maybe culture, you can say that you are cut from the same cloth if you're similar for example, I'm very, very different from my sister. We have the same parents, but we were definitely not cut from the same cloth. We have different different personalities, different characters. Would you say you were cut from the same cloth as your brothers or sister? We have some things in common. Yeah, I would. We're cut from the same cloth, but we could say that we all have a different finish. <laughs> El uh, acabado is different. <laughs> we have a different finish. Acabado finish. So you've just got similarities underneath, but maybe yeah. not on the surface. Yeah, for sure. Craig, I think very often when you hear me talking and talking, you're thinking, oh, button your lip. Button your lip. Is that what you're thinking sometimes? Shut up. No, no, never. No, I don't. I never think that of you. Oh, yeah, a lot of people do. <laughs> so if you can imagine your lip, a labio, if you had a button where you could close it. My mum used to say that to me quite a lot. Button your lip, young lad. Stop speaking. We try to make this podcast and design it especially for you. So we like to say that this podcast is tailored to your needs. Tailor is sastre, and we try to tailor this podcast to what you need in order to improve your English. Also, the courses we have available on mansioningles.com are tailored for your needs. We have business English courses, FCE first B2 courses, and all sorts of courses tailored specifically for you. So another expression is to be tailored to your needs. So Marcelo's father is a real tailor. <laughs> he works with clothes. So we've taken that verb to tailor to make clothes for someone specifically, and it's used metaphorically now. A patch is un parche. Yeah, so if you have a hole in your clothes, you might need a patch to cover them. And the expression to patch up, phrasal verb, to patch up a relationship means to recuperate a lost relationship. So imagine there's like a hole, let's say, in your friendship, it's not going well. If you patch it up, you do something to make it okay again. Like clothes which have a hole, you put the patch on them, you patch them up. You can fall out with someone, which means have an argument or something happens in the relationship, you don't get on with them, so you fall out. And if you repair that situation, as Reza said, you patch it up. You patch up the relationship. And let's sew this podcast up. So it's your turn to practice your English. Please send us a voice message because we love to hear your voices and get to know you a little bit. You can do that by going to speakpipe.com slash English podcast. How can they reach us by email, Reza? You can get Craig at craig at englishpodcast.com or me at belfastreza at gmail.com. And we would not be able to give you transcriptions of this podcast without our wonderful patrons who are helping us on Patreon. You can see all their names on our website at inglespodcast.com slash 239. Special thanks, as always, to Bruno, our gold sponsor, 
who has a walking tour company of two wonderful cities, Copenhagen. And you can find that at copenhagenwalkingtour.com. And Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, a walking tour of the favela district by local guides. It's a very safe tour and helps the community to improve on their daily needs. For more information about that tour, go to Bruno's website at favelawalkingtour.com.br. Perhaps you'd like to join our Patreon program. You can for as little as $1 per month. And that way you'll get instant access to recent transcriptions that have been lovingly transcribed, as ever, by Angelica Bello from Madrid. If you're interested, have a look at Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash English podcast. And we always welcome our latest subscribers on Patreon. So this month we have five lovely new people joining our Patreon program. Caro Torres, Jose Maria Hernandez Hernandez, Carmen Martinez, Rafael Castro Guzman, and Juan Pablo Chamorro Villoria. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce your names properly, but thank you so much for supporting us on Patreon. What's next week? On next week's episode, homographs. Homographs? So we've done homonyms and homographs homophones next week homographs please join us for that thank you very much for listening this week until then it's goodbye from him and it's goodbye from him goodbye <laughs> the music in this podcast is by pits the track is called see you later <laughs>